nothing about biosecurity, or very little indeed. So I'm not going to insult you by talking about biosecurity in great depth. But what I will be releasing on Thursday is a discussion paper on perceptions of risk. Because actually, when you think about biosecurity, you're really dealing with the various perceptions of risk which exist and how different stakeholders see those perceptions. It's no different to thinking about power supply. I have a batch at PIHA. I'm happy to put up with the fact that there's a power failure about once a week when a car hits a power pole, unfortunately. But I live, if I live in Auckland, I would be very unhappy if there was not redundancy in the power supply uh, to look after that. And if I have to have an operation, I damn well want to know that the hospital has a backup power generator. And so the perceptions of risk and the role of different stakeholders in deciding whether you need candles and a torch or whether you need a backup generator are very different. And I think when we come to biosecurity, we have the same problem. For example, I've been told yesterday, and I've probably stolen your story, of the harlequin ladybird, which some people see as a bio, potential biocontrol agent and others see it as a pest which will affect their, their, their fruit uh, harvesting. And we know that risk profiles don't stay the same. Anybody who works in a Wellington building at the present time knows that the risk profile for their building this week is very different to 10 days ago. And if we think about the major challenges affecting biosecurity, the risk profile is changing. Clearly, transport is much different to what it was. The volume of transport is different. Clearly, we're only two aeroplane rides at the most away from any country on the planet. Human factors are changed, not just because of more mobility, but because a far greater diversity of people come to Australia and New Zealand with different cultures, different attitudes to authority and institutions, and different understandings. And I think that when we think about biosecurity, we, as the last speaker said, we need to speak about human biosecurity as well as animal biosecurity. But there's also a third meaning about biosecurity, which is the issue of malevolent uh, issues in biosecurity. And if you think about it, the Kelsey virus introduction to New Zealand was against institutional authority. And you can regard the 1080 scare as another example of a biosecurity incident against humans. And our, bio and our bioeconomy is changing, and not necessarily in a way that is easy for us. We actually are a set of large monocultures, be it pine trees, be it kiwi fruit, be it rye grass and clover, be it sheep or cows. And the more monocultural your agricultural system is, the more at risk it is. Somebody was asking me last night about what was his greatest defence as a kiwi fruit farmer. Genetic diversity is your best defence against bugs of different kinds. And yet, and it was only fortunate and almost an accident that plant and food had a large number of cultivars present when the PSA epidemic broke out and they found they had a resistant cultivar which turned out to be of great uh, productivity value. And by definition, we always live in an experimental society. Everything that human beings do in terms of a social or technological innovation has a degree of risk associated with it, a degree of unknown about it. There's no such thing as proving anything to be absolutely safe. That is scientifically impossible. And therefore, different perceptions of relative risk and relative precaution always remain. On top of that, while scientists may talk in actuarial terms about risk, people perceive risk through a whole lot of lenses, whether they will benefit, whether they will not benefit, who incurs the risk, who in terms, who in terms of cost, a whole lot of biases and so forth. And of course, there's a third class of risk, political risk, institutional risk, and reputational risk. And so in risk management, all these things come together. So against that background, let me make a few comments about the role of science and R&D in biosecurity. 
As I think you've already gathered from what I'm saying, a lot of it is about a better public conversation, a lot of it is about social science, a lot of it is about behavioural science. How do we nudge people of different cultures and different backgrounds to appreciate the value of responsible ma management of their behaviours in relationship to our environment, our heritage and our economy? And we're not, we haven't in this country used extensively behavioural science to think about is what we do on an aeroplane that rather bland announcement about biosecurity actually the best way of persuading airline passengers to declare what they have in their bags. We need to do research on how we nudge people of different cultures, of different backgrounds, different heritages to think about it because at the end of the day is I'm sure every speaker has spoken about here, at the end of the day, biosecurity is ultimately a behavioural phenomenon to some extent. Then beyond that, we need to get far better at understanding the taxonomy of what plants, insects we have in this environment so we know what is natural and what is not natural. And of course DNA allows us to do that a lot better but sadly in New Zealand we are not, do not have a good systematic understanding of all the insects and animals we have in New Zealand, plants we have in New Zealand. And that leads on to what's the future of sensors, DNA technologies and so forth. And the problem at the moment is all those are designed around organisms we know about. You can only create a sensor to something that you know a lot about. And the issue of the future will be can we create sensors that are more multimodal, intelligent sensors that can look at a large number of organisms at once? I think it's inevitable in 10, 20 years' time that will happen. The issue is we need to do the research now. We need, and I'm sure others have talked about, the potential of big data and, and monitoring to track containers not just over the last trip but over the last 20 trips so we can have a far better view of where things come from. We need to think about a range of cultivars, as I've talked about before. I think the next speaker is going to talk a bit about RNA interference, or potentially. And that leads us on to the genetic technologies. There's no doubt in my mind that some form of genetic technologies will, in 10, 20 or 30 years, be our primary defence against the inevitable incursions that will occur. We will never be able to stop every incursion. And the issue is, how will we get social licence for these new technologies? That is the big issue for Australia, for New Zealand, for every society. As will these new technologies develop, how will societies decide whether to use them or not? Think what would have happened. I want to finish with a mind game. Imagine if the first use of the internet had been clearly by the world trade bombers and not for social media. The world would have reacted against that technology. Imagine if the first use of GM had been by government agencies to produce a food that reduced the incidence of diabetes in the world. We would have had a different response. It's all about cost and benefit. And we need to get far better at having good discussions with society, not late in the development of technology, but at the beginning of the development of a technology, so we can understand what society will allow to happen at what pace. I was telling somebody last night, remember margarine? Margarine first was allowed to be sold in New Zealand in 19, without a prescription in 1972. For the hundred years before that, all sorts of barriers had been put in place by the dairy industry to stop margarine being sold for economic reasons by the incumbent. And it was only when margarine started to be made from cotton and soya oils that the American politicians discovered that they had another constituency, the soya and cotton farmers fighting the dairy farmers, that margarine became accepted. So there's a lot of things in this about social licensing.